So when we're talking about strength training for sprinting, right off the bat, we're gonna focus initially for this video just on the 100 meters or 200 meters. And these are all concepts that can transfer really, really well to field-based sports, to even court-based sports like basketball, where there is running involved. But one of the easiest things you can do, especially in the world of track and field, is to try and break those events down into different phases. And if we're talking about that 100 meters, I like to break it down into the start phase, a drive phase, maximum mechanics, the drive phase is gonna be more acceleration, maximum mechanics, and then that final aspect, which is slow down the slowest. The individual who slows down the slowest is gonna hold that top end speed over a longer period of time. And what this does for us as coaches is we can sort of break it down into each and every aspect that we need to so we can start to see okay the start's a little bit slow or the drive phase is slow or the drive phase they have bad mechanics or at maximum mechanics they don't hold an upright torso so we can start to really see where are the problems with our sprinters but we got to go a little bit deeper now once we're understanding these phases start drive maximum mechanics and then slow down the slowest now we can take that step back even further so after we break down these phases we've got to start to think about a whole bunch of different factors that what goes into running quickly and if we want to think about running fast sprinting as fast as possible envision Usain Bolt breaking the world record right what made him so good it was his technique and his physical ability so now that we understand that technique physical ability now we as strength coaches we can take that step back further and we can start to understand all right in each in every single phase, what are the key factors here? We've got to understand all of Newton's laws of motion. And if we can immediately think about Newton's third law, for every action, there's an opposite and equal reaction. So what's that mean? Right off the start, however much force we can get our sprinters to apply into the blocks or to apply into the earth, the earth or the blocks will give that much energy back into the individual. So the more force that we can generate right off the start, the more force will return into that individual as long as the technique and body angles hold true to what is needed. So then we can start to dive into, all right, where else does this factor into? Newton's third law could also piece into how are we running with arms? If our arms are running all over the place, well, now that was, is going to take away from our dynamic trunk control. If we can hold dynamic trunk control at top end speed based off of our training in the weight room and we have proper mechanics, Newton's third law will hold true through maximal mechanics and through slowing down the slowest. It's gonna hold true no matter what, but we need to make sure that there's a minimal amount of external action that's going to impede on the success of our speed. That's gonna take us into that second law. So that second law is focusing on acceleration is essentially force divided by that mass. And that's gonna play a key role into our start, into our drive phase. The ability to accelerate is all about how much force we can put out divided by how much relative mass we have as individuals, as sprinters. Someone that has a little bit less body weight or body fat and can put out a ton of force, they're going to be able to accelerate a lot faster. So that's gotta be another trigger. Okay, how can we get somebody, one, to maintain a lean body weight, but also two, put out a tremendous amount of force so that they can accelerate at a higher rate. If that's factored in, now we can start to understand how to get out of the blocks a little quicker, how to get through the drive phase a little bit faster, and how to hold those maximal mechanics. And then finally, when we get into the first law, every object that's in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by uneven forces. So what does that mean? That, that's talking about uh, somebody who's running at full speed, there's always going to be a braking mechanism. Every time the sprinter grounds, there's going to be a period of braking. That is how physics and biomechanics works in the human body. But the way to overcome that based on Newton's first law brings us to the period of impulse and what everything comes back to. At least what I believe in the realm of strength training for sprinting is that every single thing once we understand the first law and its impact 
on the actual sprint. Once we understand the second law and its impact on the phases, and once we understand the third law and the impact on phases, and we know that technique and physical ability are the key factors behind fueling the success of the sprinter, the key behind all of this comes back to angles for technique and force development. So what's the shin angle when we're coming out of the blocks? What's the body's angle when we're coming out of the box? Ideally, it's gonna be at 45 degrees. Women, it's gonna be a little bit higher because they're not as explosive, but the more explosive we can get our women, the closer they're gonna get to that 45 degrees. Now there's some people like Maurice Green who used to come out below 45 degrees and that worked for him very, very well, but we don't wanna see somebody running all squatty coming out of, that, out of the blocks going through that drive phase. So we've gotta really focus on what are those angles that we wanna hit? What are the angles that we wanna hold when we're running at maximal mechanics? We wanna make sure that we are upright, that we, we do have nice hip extension, we do have strong mobility through our entire body, we do have mobility through our dorsiflex ankle, and we also understand what exercises can contribute to dynamic trunk control so that when we're at maximal mechanics, our arms are not disrupting what our upper body is doing. But I believe everything comes back to period of impulse. The longer the period of impulse, obviously there's a point of diminishing returns, but the longer that period of impulse is, the more force the athlete can provide to the ground, which it then gets a positive response back, a reaction back from the ground. When we start to think of things through an increase in, in impulse means an increase in momentum. When we think of things through the phases, when we think of things through that period of impulse, now we can start to analyze the start. The period of impulse is going to be much longer, right? So we can start to think about something like a back squat, something like a front squat, a pause back squat, a pause front squat, a static started clean. That's going to contribute to that starting phase. It's going to help us coordinate a large amount of force which is then gonna help us accelerate from the start into the drive phase. Now we head into the drive phase. How long is that period of impulse going to be? That period of impulse is going to start to shorten comparative to the start. It's still going to be longer relative to the last two phases. Now we can start to think about, all right, we've got that angle, we know the shin angle, we know where that neutral head needs to be, we don't wanna see us tucking the chin too much because that can lead to some hamstring issues. We need really, really strong glutes, we need really, really strong hamstrings, we need really strong quads during the drive phase, but it comes back to that period of impulse. Single leg squats, more Olympic lifts, more unilateral work, anything along those lines is gonna really contribute to the drive phase because we've gotta remember, when we're sprinting, everything is going to be done unilaterally. So now, when we get out of that drive phase and we head into maximal mechanics and slowing down the slowest, the period of impulse is going to be much shorter. So now we have to think about what's the period of impulse, when it's really, really short, what movements are gonna help us improve impulse so that we can have a higher rate of momentum. When we're at maximal mechanics and when we're trying to slow down the slowest, we've got to start to think about single leg bounds, double leg bounds, you know, skips for height, skips for distance. When it comes back to impulse, then we've got to start to think about technique. And when we're programming anything, any time that we are focusing on weight room strength, we've got to factor in how is this going to improve our technique how is this, is it going to be from a strength perspective? Is it going to be from a mobility perspective? Is it going to be from a technical perspective, from a mindset perspective? Now we start to figure out all of these different things just from that 100 meter race. So when it comes down to the duty of the strength coach and the relationship that we need to have with coaches that are on the track, it's got to be simple. It has to be broken down into phases. Where are they the slowest? Where do they have the worst technical perspective on each and every single phase? Then we've got to understand Newton's laws. But the biggest thing is factoring and understanding impulse. Impulse is when our foot grounds, the period that it's grounded, and how much force we can apply into the ground during that short or longer period of ground contact. So understanding phases, period of impulse, 
and the athlete's weakness inside of the race is going to be the absolute key factor behind strength training for sports. When you understand the phases, when you understand period of impulse, when you understand technique and how physical ability in the weight room can impact that period of impulse, how physical ability in the weight room, physical training in the weight room can impact technique, now we can improve the period of impulse, which is going to help us run a lot faster and we can apply and understand if somebody has a weak start, what exercises go and improve the start. If somebody has a slow drive phase, what can we do in the weight room that's going to apply directly to the drive phase? If somebody has poor maximal velocity, max mechanics, what can we do in the weight room? Can we do dumbbell snatch into a hip lock? Can we do single leg bounds? Can we do uh, skips for distance? Like I've mentioned, all these things start to factor in because we're starting to see things through the lens of the phases and the period of impulse and the impact that those key factors have on sprint based training. So you've got to understand all those different factors to develop a proper program. If you want help with a speed based program, click on the link down below. We have a how to get faster program designed specifically for field based sports. If you want more information about sprint based training, you can click on this card right here. Until next time, guys, peace.